Okay, so uh, thanks for being present at the picture. Uh, I've been told that everybody was smiling, so it's good. So, um, and for the last two hours of the day, we have um, a lecture by Andy McKenzie on hydrodynamic transport in electronic system. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to, ooh, could we uh, turn down the volume? I have a pretty loud voice. You okay, is that? Oh, sounds booming to me, okay, good. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to come along and give you these talks. The way I'll handle it is that we'll talk until about maybe 10 to five, then take a break and then carry on for the rest of it to give you guys some chance to uh, keep your concentration going late in the day. So, I, I'm an experimental physicist and the bulk of what I'm going to be telling you today will be a, an experimental story. It's the story of whether or not hydrodynamic regimes of electron transport are observable and why these are hard experiments and the progress which is being made towards turning this into a more routine thing. My own work on this subject is done in collaboration with a number of people. I probably haven't listed everybody there. Uh, but they are um, experimentalists from uh, extremely important people like Seung Hoon Kim and Pallavi Kushwaha who grow the crystals, experimental measuring people like Maya Bachman and Nabanil and Nandi who are two very good graduate students, uh, and also what's really important to this, well there's Phil King and Veronica Sunko who do photo emission which has been very helpful in setting up the materials that we work on. But particularly important to me has been an interaction with theorists, Joel Moore from Berkeley, Burkhard Schmidt from our institute, and really in particular, Thomas Scafidi, who's currently at Berkeley but is moving to a faculty position at Toronto. So I've known Thomas since he was a graduate student uh, at Oxford a few years ago. And uh, yeah, I was gonna say, he's taught me a lot, but in some senses, we've also learned a lot together really focusing on this, pro this, uh, this issue of how can you honestly do a theory experiment comparison to really make progress in this field as opposed to at times maybe exaggerating what you're doing. So what I'll do then, what I hope to do is to give you some background and then I'll tell you a little bit of very general stuff about hydrodynamic flow and what's called the minimum viscosity conjecture that minimum viscosity conjecture was made outside electronic systems altogether, but it's part of my own motivation for getting interested in electron hydrodynamics, so I wanted to tell you something about that. Then I'll tell you a bit about the historical development of the field, because the, the minimum viscosity conjecture stuff came about 12 years ago now, and it stimulated a lot of research on electron hydrodynamics. A lot of that research seemed to have forgotten, as often is the case, an earlier wave of theoretical research, and as far as I know, the first people to look at these problems theoretically were in the Soviet Union in the 1960s. So then I'll go on to telling you about experiments. Yeah, if I can work my pointer. I'll tell you about experiments in graphene. I'll also mention the old ones in semiconductors. And then I'll tell you something about the material that we're working on, which are very high conductivity oxides called the delafossites. And hopefully by the end I can draw some conclusions. Throughout all of the, the talk, I don't, I'm going to have quite a few references on my slides. Those are designed to help you uh, get an end to the field if you get interested and you want to read some of the source, source literature. But it isn't a proper review talk, so I'm almost certainly missing out some papers and that would uh, unintentionally upset people, but this is really just meant to be a for example to give you guys a way into the field. So let me now uh, start, if you like, right at the beginning and remind you about what hydrodynamic flow means. So let's imagine we just have a pipe and we're putting a hydrodynamic fluid through it. It's called hydrodynamics because it was developed for water, but it could be for many fluids. And I'm gonna draw this pipe not as a pipe, but as a two-dimensional channel because all the experiments are being done in two dimensions. 
So if you have an empty two-dimensional channel and you're trying to push this fluid through it by putting a pressure gradient across it, what you would find if you had a microscope that would measure the velocity profile is that it would be less at the edges than it is at the middle. And that's because the fluid in, in a hydrodynamic fluid, the only way it develops flow resistance is through its interaction with the boundaries. Everything that happens internally is uh, irrelevant to the flow resistance unless there's a boundary that acts as a momentum sink. However, not quite everything's irrelevant because you might then say, well, why isn't that element of fluid just flowing with no resistance at all? And the point is that any fluid contains some transverse coupling from the part in the middle to the element next door to the element next door, etc., out to the edges. And the way I think of it is that that transverse coupling is the quantity which is being parameterized by the shear viscosity, eta. So uh, eta is uh, often quoted as a kinematic viscosity where you take out the mass density. So I'll kind of flip to and fro, but usually I'll be using the kinematic viscosity when I'm discussing viscosities. The other thing I didn't say in the preamble at the beginning, of course, is that I completely welcome questions during the talk. I don't really know what level you guys are at, and so uh, I'm very happy to answer whatever you need. So let's look at this a little bit more microscopically. How was I able to make those statements? Well, whatever the fluid is, it's flowing through this channel, and that does not mean that there are no interactions going on inside the fluid. The fluid particles are, of course, having multiple collisions with each other all the time whether that's water or liquid helium-3 or any of these fluids. The point is that when the particles bounce off each other, from the point of view of momentum, they just exchange momentum. And the resistance is determined by the net momentum of the whole assembly. So if all they're doing is exchanging, they're not relaxing that momentum of their whole assembly. So, you know, shockingly or surprisingly, if that wire, that channel were infinitely wide, uh, or there were perfectly slippery boundaries, there would be no flow resistance, no matter what the viscosity was. Right? So these electrons, or these particles, and later to be electrons, are bouncing off each other like crazy. And then when, they get to the, when an element gets to the wall, it will bounce off the wall. And if you have rough boundary conditions, there's a chance that it will bounce backwards. In other words, relax some of its momentum to the wall. And it's those wall momentum relaxing events which are so important to us. So to parameterize this situation and understand all the physics you needed to, you would need some boundary conditions. You would need to know the mean free path between those momentum conserving collisions. And the flow resistance would still depend in some way on a characteristic width dimension of the, of the channel. Now, most of you guys are solid state condensed matter physicists, I guess, like I am. And if you're a condensed matter physicist, there's something which is uh, very non-intuitive about viscosity when you think about it microscopically. And it's the following. The, imagine you had an element of fluid here with a very short momentum conserving mean free path. It's quite hindered that element or the a molecule in that element from reaching the boundary. If, however, the mean free path is much longer, the element near the middle of the, of the uh, fluid can reach the wall much more efficiently and therefore relax its momentum more efficiently. So that means that the shear viscosity, which, uh, which is talking about this transverse coupling, is proportional to the momentum conserving mean free path. And that's very surprising because we're always really used to the idea that resistivity in a real metal is inversely proportional to a mean free path. But what we're going to get to is that there are two kinds of mean free paths you need to consider. Okay. So, and then in these circumstances, if you knew, in general, if you know the number for this momentum conserving mean free path, you can straightforwardly estimate the viscosity. If you know the viscosity and the width and the boundary conditions, you can calculate the flow resistance based on the Navier-Stokes equations. So that would be the, the hydrodynamic kind of pathway that you would be using. Now, what about a quantum fluid then? Uh, so let's think about uh, helium-3. So this is helium-3 going from being a classical fluid 
at of order uh, three degrees. That's roughly where its degeneracy temperature is. So its Fermi temperature is of order a few degrees. And then as you go down in temperature, its viscosity diverges as one over the temperature squared. And again, that's a slightly surprising thing to see when you first see it, but it's just the same physics. What's happening is because it's a Fermi liquid, the scattering is getting cut off as one over T squared. So the internal mean free path is going up as one over T squared. So it's getting more viscous. Now, I guess, how many experimentalists are there in the audience? Yeah, we are in the minority here, aren't we? Well, the experimentalists should know this, but the theorists should know it as well, because you've all looked at results which have come from uh, measurements made in a so-called dilution fridge. So if you wanted to do millikelvin measurements today, typically you use a dilution fridge to get to those temperatures. And here, this divergence of the viscosity really comes in because there's no fundamental reason, no fundamental limit, as far as we know, on the base temperature that a dilution fridge could have. Right? The thermodynamic process is valid um, uh, as far down as we know. But a dilution fridge, even if you're going to pay a lot of money for it, will have a base temperature of 7 to 10 millikelvin. And that's simply a pumping issue, because by then, helium-3 has about the viscosity of motor oil. And you're trying to pump it through capillaries as part of what you're doing in making that dilution fridge. So uh, the actual temperature-dependent viscosity of helium-3 is what means that you cut off your dilution fridge operation uh, uh, way before helium-3 goes superfluid. Okay. So, now that, so that was the basics of hydrodynamics without thinking of any electrons. Now let's go a little bit further about motivation for why we should care. <clears throat> and a lot of interest has been, uh, applied re or has been generated recently by a very simple uncertainty-based, principle-based argument that tells you that there's a time, and exactly characterizing that time and knowing the meaning of this is more complicated, but it's easy to see that in a system where temperature is the only energy scale, there's a time which is going to be of order h bar over kBt. Okay. And people now have put, and so this was the significance of this was mentioned in Sachdev's famous book on quantum phase transitions and by some other people earlier as well. Very recently, people are putting uh, more theoretical flesh on the bones in terms of defining it as the most, the shortest time by which you can equilibrate. It's kind of a shortest equilibrium time, or it's the shortest time of, it's like the, the, this paper is in terms of the Lyapunov time in quantum chaos, right? But in, in many ways that you look at this, you get lots of observations and lots of theoretical calculations that tell you that this, if you like, there's a minimum time of relevance in a thermal system, and it's given by that. So that same idea in a few lines can be turned over, to, 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 turned over to, to give you something about a bound on, so, so in other words, if this becomes a bound, in other words, tau must be greater than or equal to that number, that is equivalent to saying that the viscosity divided by the entropy density must be one upon four pi, must be greater than one upon four pi times that ratio. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> most of you are from condensed matter, this was a paper that came out of string theory and was first talking about the quark-gluon plasma because when they measured the viscosity of the quark-gluon plasma at very, very strong coupling when the scattering was as high as they could make it, they realized that that was an extremely low number they were getting for the viscosity and they were, they were interested about why. Not only is it a low number, it's a number pretty close to this proposed bound. So this is a, not a particularly well-known paper in condensed matter physics but it's extremely well known across physics, one of these papers that probably has a couple of thousand citations by now. So that's not exactly minority work. Now, that then goes, that's where the interest then goes over uh, from that field to electron systems, because we have lots of ways now of se selecting electron systems and putting them in circumstances where something like that minimum time is applying. And therefore, 
could it be that there's a minimum viscosity conjecture to go with the viscosity of electrons as well as other forms of matter? So thoughts like that stimulated some fantastic theoretical papers, uh, which are you know extreme. They're interesting. They're thought provoking. Uh, it's, as I'm going to tell you, not yet clear that we can do experiments to really test what they're saying. But, so, but maybe one of them, the paper on graphene, which has uh, Schmalley and Muller and Fritz on it, they made some concrete suggestions, some of which do appear to have been seen now. Okay, so, so that generated uh, th this idea of going into very strange metallic fluids and looking for very low viscosities is pretty topical. Alongside that, came uh, the rebirth of lots of other theories which are saying, we're not going to go to a strongly coupled fluid. We're going to go to what these guys would think of as a weakly coupled fluid, in other words, a Fermi liquid. So we're going to go to a Fermi liquid with well-defined quasi-particles, and we're going to think about electron Fermi liquids, and we're going to think about what the consequences would be if we could drive those electron quasi-particles into a hydrodynamic regime. So with all of this going on, and uh, some experimentalists being friends of some of these theorists, I guess a number of groups believed in about 2014 that they were asking themselves whether uh, electronic hydrodynamics was observable. Actually, now that I know the literature better, I realize that we were re-asking that question. Uh, but it's certainly been worth re-asking, and we've managed to extend now the systems where it's being seen. Yeah, question. We'll get there. So why is it a challenge? Why don't we just turn it on and do it? And this next five slides is going to be attempting to answer that question. The thing is that when you're passing an electrical current through your electron channel made of something, the pipe isn't empty. right? And so in, in these empty pipe things for water and helium, it's been very easy to say to yourself, OK, all of these internal collisions are momentum conserving. Actually, in a solid, arguably exactly the reverse is true. Because solids have impurities. And the, the, if you bounce off an impurity in the bulk of the solid, you're straight away dumping your momentum out in the bulk rather than having to get to the boundaries. And any viscous effect is real, the, the absolute start point of any viscosity measurement is that the boundaries have to be extremely important relative to the bulk. Okay, but now it gets worse. So, I mean, the impurity question is a really nasty one. Most of our materials are far too dirty. But then we have to think about other forms of scattering as well that take place in solids. So, <clears throat> recapping, to get resistivity in the traditional way, you must relax the total momentum of the conduction electrons. I'm now meaning an infinite sample without boundaries. So impurities will do it, as I said. But also, solids vibrate, creating phonons, and electrons can scatter from those phonons. So one process you have is what's called a normal electron-phonon scattering process, where some electron on the Fermi surface will either absorb or emit a, a, a phonon. The energetics means that that's a quasi-elastic process. And so you could certainly create resistivity with these normal electron phonon processes. And in almost every case, that's what you're doing. Almost always, normal electron phonon processes are momentum relaxing. And anything in bulk which is momentum relaxing is the enemy of hydrodynamics. We'll come to the exception later. Now here we get what people regard as the good guy, particularly in semiconductors and graphene. Electron-electron scattering in so-called normal processes is just the analog of helium-3 quasiparticles scattering from each other in helium-3. Electrons scattering from each other in an isotropic system do not relax the electron assembly's momentum. Right? And so if you're a hydro fan, those are good things. Except that we then get into the problems with umclap scattering. So umclap scattering is best thought of in the following. So you imagine you have an electron sitting on the Fermi surface, and you have some scatterer, whether it's another electron or a phonon, which is able to scatter through uh, mod k or mod q, which is that radius. That gives you a circle of allowed scattering events. 
And if you were just in free space, if you were of this radius, because you need to conserve energy, you could only scatter onto two points on the Fermi surface. Right? However, that's not true because in a solid you have crystal momentum. So you can think you have to think about the Fermi surface in the repeated zone scheme. And that same radius uh, of circle can be scattering you from the first zone to the second zone. So it's scattering you from there to those two points as well. Those two points are equivalent by periodicity to those two points. So that umclap process, even for electron-electron scattering, involves the reciprocal lattice, and so it involves the crystal momentum, and it becomes momentum relaxing. So both electron-phonon umclap and electron-electron umclap are always momentum relaxing. So as we first went through the scorecard, we have impurities, normal phonons, electron umclap, and electron phonon umclap, which are all trying to kill the observ observability of hydrodynamics. And at the first count, only electron electron normal processes are helping it. I'm going to show you in a minute that there's one exception to that. So, so this is part of why uh, looking for the right regime is so difficult. So given all of these momentum relaxing collisions, let's go back to velocity pro profiles. And if you calculate the velocity profile for a typical material um, from its boundaries right across the sample to the boundaries again, yeah, the boundaries will come in and, and, and give you a slightly lower velocity at the boundary. But basically, as soon as you've got any small distance away from the boundary, scaled by the momentum relaxing mean free path, then the velocity is just going to go to constant, and it's going to be constant all the way across the wire. And that constant velocity profile, of course, is implicit in Ohm's law. So when you go and use Ohm's law to study conductivity, as we all do, that's what you're assuming. You're assuming that the viscous effects really aren't playing a big role and that the boundaries are far away. Uh, and the other thing, so then that brings out that Ohm's law is an empirically derived law. It's not a fundamental law of conduction in solids. Because if you change the parameters to ones where the electrons looked more hydrodynamic, you could get a quadratic velocity profile of the same type as I showed you before. So what do we do when, and yeah, I guess up here I would say 99.9999% of metals are in this regime. Uh, and, you know, if you're a hydro guy, that's a bit sad. So how do we handle that? Well, we do it in the usual way that you handle theory in condensed matter. You say, okay, we just forget the outliers, and we use theories to analyze our data, which are based effectively on Ohm's law. So in a Boltzmann approach, it's saying we throw away all the interesting terms that you would have to think about in hydro and you only keep the ones that are in this normal standard case. And that's a very dangerous thing when you're analyzing experiments because it's a very hardwired philosophy in the minds of experimentalists or condensed matter theorists thinking about experiments in condensed matter. And basically, you're in the usual case. If you make an observation and you only, you only analyze it with one kind of a theory, uh, you're not going to find out that another kind of a theory would, would apply in, until you generalize the way you're doing things. But most of me, you know, there's this old joke. I don't know if you know the guy um, that invented QCD, or oh, got the Nobel Prize for QCD, Murray Gelman. He refers to our whole field as squalid state physics, that we are studying the physics of dirt no matter what we're trying to do, right? And, you know, these, these, it's a very nasty joke for us, but it's a bit close to the truth, which is why it's a good one. So in most of the squalid state, here's where we sit. So lucky uh, for the development of the field, there's always somewhere in the world, somewhere in the literature, the 0.001% guy. And in this case, it was a guy called Gurji, working in the Soviet, working in Soviet Union and publishing in the early 60s. And he began to uh, think about, he wrote these uh, papers about because of these type of helium-3 effects, the idea that in a Fermi li liquid, viscosity would go up again at low temperatures, he wrote that you might find that in metals, you got a resistivity minimum at very low temperatures because they were so pure. 
because what you were seeing would be a mixture between ordinary ohmic flow and a hydrodynamic term, right? And he was probably actually thinking about the history. He was probably uh, not misled, but he was probably motivated there because there was a huge amount of experimental study at the time of resistance minima in solids because of the Kondo effect. So the Kondo paper is probably not long after that. It's about the same time. And uh, you know, Gurji was probably thinking, well, Kondo type physics isn't the only way that you might be able to get a minimum. So those papers are uh, certainly of, uh, of historical interest and relevance, and I encourage you to read them if you, if you like this field. But what Gurji really did was just to lay out in a very simple couple of pages the fact that instead of dealing only with, with one mean free path and one device scale, if you add this second mean free path, one for momentum conserving collisions, one for momentum relaxing ones, and then your device scale, you were likely to have enough parameters to construct a theory that would allow you to see the crossover as well between a hydrodynamic regime and an ohmic regime. And uh, obviously, there's these two limits. Actually, there are more than two, which complicates things, but we'll forget about that for today. If you're in this usual regime, where you're so squalid that LMR is very short, then you're ohmic. If you were able to engineer it, uh, this, this is great. Can't use my own technology. Ah, sod it. Right, it's been one of those days. This lecture nearly didn't happen because I got lost in that park. Sent Roderick an abusive email saying you need to send a helicopter to come and get me. Uh, let's see, right now, can I get myself back to my, yes, I can, I'm not that bad, right. So if you can manage, if you can achieve this regime where the momentum conserving mean free path is much smaller than the other two in the problem, then that would be electron hydrodynamics. But for lots of very good materials reasons, it's tough. And if you're a sensible person, uh, we're going to see that my own research is not in this regime, so that's why I can make that joke. If you're a sensible person, the place to try and do this is in semiconductors or semi-metals for a re range of reasons. So the first thing is that heterodoping, these techniques in, in high purity semiconductor electron gases, they allow you to achieve very long mean free paths with very low impurity scattering. The other thing is, I didn't really labor it, but if you go away and play with these diagrams for electron electron umclap, you realize that if your Fermi surface is very small, you can be below a critical size where no umclap processes can take place. No electron scattering can find the Fermi surface in the second zone because it's so far away on the scale of KF. So in semiconductors, you can suppress electron-electron unclap, which is a very good thing. And there are also tricks you can play to try and suppress the electron phonon scattering. So you can play tricks to essentially get the electrons to a much higher temperature than the background vibrational temperature. So, and then the, and, when, and this is really important because if you've got the electron gas up to a rather high temperature, then you're getting up towards its Fermi temperature and you're hugely increasing the quasi-particle, quasi-particle scattering rate by doing that. So all of these things say there may be a chance, particularly since in the semiconductor two DEGs, you cannot, they were the first system where experimentalists really developed these techniques of mesoscopic device fabrication. So that led to a number of successes in the 1990s that were forgotten and have now been re-remembered. So there, are, there were hydrodynamic predictions of, uh, of or hydrodynamic explanations or hydrodynamic theories were used to account for plasma oscillations in the terahertz. These were actually important papers for electrical engineering and they're very well cited in the electrical engineering community because at the time, terahertz radiation was a very difficult thing to get and work with. But much more directly relevant to what I'm going to be telling you about the modern experiments were some fantastic experiments done by Lawrence Molenkamp and his graduate student, De Jong, right back in the early 90s. And they just did 
the semiconductor equivalent of the simple flow experiment that I've been telling you about. So they made, with gating and microfabrication, they made wires with W of order 4 microns. With care, impurity mean free paths of tens of microns can be achieved in semiconductors. When I say with care, I mean after 25 years development. So, and, and in only a few very specialized labs. And then their key idea was that because they had one two-dimensional electron gas buried in a lattice of, lots of, of, of you know, the background um, gallium arsenide, or the background silicon, so they just have all the dopants and all of this stuff and then this one rather pure layer. They showed that you can push, push a high current through that very pure layer and heat it up to considerably higher temperatures than the background. So you try and keep your whole sample with a standard cooling thing at say 10 millik, then you heat your electrons up to much higher than that. And that's this trick of getting yourself quite close to the degeneracy temperature of a low density system and therefore allowing lots of electron-electron scattering. So in the graphs I'll show you in a moment, we won't talk much about this one, I have nicer ones in a second. What, what you have then is this current axis, because they're heating their electrons with the current, they didn't know how to calibrate it in those days. Now they're doing noise spectroscopy where they can. But from these 1990s paper, that current axis, uh, the mod of the current is related to the electron temperature. Maybe not linearly, but there's some relation. And then the temperature, that is the, these, these uh, curves are being drawn on top of each other at different lattice temperatures. So that's the overall thing. How did you, how, how, what was the temperature your dilution fridge was at? And then they studied the differential conductance, the differential resistance, but don't worry, that's just like the resistance. So what they then did was to combine these and they got a lot of curves looking like so. And basically what's happening here is that you're starting with some ordinary resistance. And you notice that these effects are pretty small on the background, right? So because everywhere where people are studying hydrodynamics and electron systems, they aren't studying real hydrodynamics. They're studying the point at which viscosity begins to play a role in what you observe. So you're always trying to observe a viscous effect beyond the background. So what they're seeing is that they have a certain amount of resistance, and then uh, as they uh, heat the wire up, first of all, the mean free path, uh, uh, yeah, they, they heat the wire up and they create the usual thing that's happening of the resistance going up as you heat, as you heat a wire, uh, you heat electrons. But as they're doing that, the electron-electron length is coming down so the thing's getting more viscous, and eventually the resistance turns over, so that as the wire gets hotter, the resistivity goes down again. And that's that, like that Gurji minimum. So basically what's happening there is the wire is getting hotter, so the viscosity is getting smaller. As the viscosity gets smaller, the resistance goes down, the flow resistance goes down for the same given boundary conditions. And what they did, which was very appealing to us, was they did a development of Boltzmann theory to go beyond and include beyond the standard, uh, which is called the relaxation time approximation, and they then included higher order terms in the analysis, which gave them sensitivity to be able to analyze hydrodynamic effects if they had them. And within that uh, theory, they uh, were able to publish pretty satisfactory qualitative agreement between the theory they were doing and the uh, data they were taking. I guess everybody's work, this is a very young field, and everybody's work, certainly including our own work, has uh, its hidden secrets and the hidden not so nice bits. And the hidden not so nice bit of de Jong and Molenkamp's work, I believe it must be correct, I mean, it all agreed too well, but they don't actually physically understand their boundaries very well. And Anything that you're going to do with these hydrodynamic calculations, whether it's based on Boltzmann equation or whether it's based on Navier-Stokes, you've still got a boundary condition in there. You still have an assumption of how you relax the momentum at the boundaries. And basically, the one they've used there is the one that matches the data the best, I think. Right? And, and you know, one does always have to just uh, think about that. Uh, I think in any of these flow experiments, you always have to be aware 
that there are hidden things going on about boundary conditions that aren't being discussed as openly as they might be. Now, Jörg Schmalian is a deliciously open guy. So he and his student, uh, Igor Kizilev, have just published a really nice paper uh, about all the hidden secrets of what uh, boundary conditions can do to you in electron, uh, electron experiments. So I'm uh, you know, feeling like I've talked for a very long time, even though it's only 35 minutes. Does anybody have any questions that are going to liven this up with? Is your question answered yet? <laughs> You're not going to say no. OK, good. So you define, you define hydrodynamic transport as you, you do an experiment, you get a data set, you find features in that data set that you can model by taking into account the viscosity of the electron fluid instead of the resist see the resistivity that we're all used to is the property of the medium that the fluid is flowing through. The viscosity is a property of the fluid. And they, they have fundamentally different signatures in principle in experiments. So what you're always looking for is an experimental signal, ideally that you can model with a viscous theory that you cannot model with a conventional one. And the claim in this paper is that that turnover of resistivity, where that resistivity is going down, only by, you know, what, 20 and 400, only by 5%. That 5% uh, correction as a function of this current is their evidence that they are getting into the hydrodynamic regime of transport. Okay, good. Yes, oh, I well, can I ask him, then I'll ask you, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so, um, Graphene, there's two kinds of hydrodynamic claim because you have tuning. We're just about to see that when you dope graphene to semi-metallic dopings similar to the densities used in the semiconductor experiments, you can see very sim similar things in the differential resistance of graphene. You can also, though, try to tune graphene right towards the charge neutrality point you run into some disorder effects, but there is a second regime of graphene where people have looked at thermal transport, where they claim that they can see huge differences from Fermi liquid thermal transport that they associate with being right in at the charge neutrality point. I'm going to mention those experiments, but I'm not going to describe them to you in much detail. What we are basically always consider considering today, because it allows us to co um, compare different systems, are systems with at least semi-metallic densities. Why don't you do it? Very, very good question. Uh, very good question for, with the answer being just the thing I didn't include in the talk. So I was trying to give you guys a chance at this time in the afternoon by saying everything's about ohmic and hydrodynamic. But actually, there's a third regime which is relevant to your question, which is called the ballistic regime. So if you make your wire, so what you're wanting is a wire which has lots and lots of internal momentum relaxing collisions. As soon as I draw on the board, you see why I PowerPoint my slides, right? I, and so that you've got a lot of scattering going on inside your wire on the scale of your width. If you get into the regime where you make your wire so narrow that none of the internal length scales is shorter than the wire size, then you're in a regime called a ballistic regime where you get these effects where an electron between scattering events is always going to find a boundary basically for almost every direction it's on. Okay, and that's an entirely, not an entirely, but it's a, an interesting but different non-hydrodynamic uh, regime of transport. If you want, but a lot of these things are about words because in the old theory of gases, so uh, you know the, the original kinetic theories of viscosity were done by guys like Maxwell and people working uh, for gases going through pipes. And 
What we call the ballistic regime in electrons is called the Knudsen regime for anybody who studied hydrodynamics in a hydrodynamic system. It's where one mean free pass takes you to the edge. When you get uh, with this negative differential resistivity, that's going to what's called the Poiseuille regime. And the Poiseuille is the hydrodynamics I'm telling you about. Acceptable? For now? Good. Other questions? Yep. In, in high frequency experiments, or, or what do you think? What? Okay, so my, I'm a DC guy. Microwaves count as high frequencies. There are certainly uh, hydrodynamic effects. In fact, one of our organizers, I'll reference one of his papers on that uh, later. So, yes, you can think about what would happen at those frequencies in a, uh, in a hydrodynamic fluid. Uh, but there's very little experiment so far because making a hydrodynamic fluid of electrons is so, so hard. Yep. Well, well, you could, but, but, but what you could do is even worse. You could go with the same geometry of the channel, and then you can think of what, is, what happens when an electron meets the boundary, right? And you've got two limits, one, well, three, two, two limits. In, in um, typical hydrodynamics uh, textbooks, they use sticky boundary conditions. So they just basically say the all of the x velocity is stopped when you get to the boundary, right? So the velocity is zero at the boundary. But if you had totally specular scattering, then you would have essentially no momentum dissipation at the boundary of the x momentum. So the reality is always going to be somewhere in between. Yep. This, there, is, there are no quant, these are all semi classical calculations. Um, in the regimes where the experiments are being done, they seem to be perfectly capable of matching what people see, but that's the main motivation for saying that the quantum, the quantum corrections aren't important. I mean, this is a very young field. Obviously, that is an important next phase. It's also probably an important next phase to start doing the experiments at lower temperatures than they've been done at already to try and see whether quantum corrections are observable experimentally. To be honest, experimentally, we're still at the stage of seeing fairly small corrections to ohmic theory. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're not there yet. We're also not there in, as I'll say at the end of the talk, in going to most of the really strongly coupled fluids. Yes? Indeed, you hope that you could, yes. And, uh, and particularly our theory colleagues are uh, putting a lot of thought into doing that, indeed. Uh, probably, yeah, the, the issue is you then have to find ways of really being confident that when you've fabricated your sample into those unusual shapes, you haven't done anything to it as you've been, as you've been doing that. But certainly in our group, working with Roderick Mersner's, Roderick Mersner's department next door, you know, ideas are coming up for ways that you might do precisely that enhancement. And in some senses, I'm going to show you an experiment done on graphene later, which involved specially tailoring the ways that the blockages you made the fluid flow through. That was, that was more than I expected. That's excellent. And I had better say a few more things before the break. So. Yeah, so this is the graphene equivalent of the 1994 de Jong and Molenkamp experiment. It's pretty cool, though. Uh, the Geim group who published this only put it in their supplementary information. They were saying, OK, you know, just repeating what's gone on before in graphene isn't so interesting to us. We want to discuss something really new. And what they did was the following. They 
studied a situation where they put current in the end of a bar and they sunk it over here and they studied the voltage as a function of distance for various devices as they moved away from that current sink but staying very close to it. So this is a two micron scale bar by working with, and that means that those contacts are probably a couple of hundred nanometers wide and they're spaced by about a micron from each other. They're managing to keep those separations of order of some of the microscopic length scales in graphene of the electrons. And what they say, and was also backed up by other independent theory by Levitov's group, what they point out is that if you only have ohmic conduction and you're just start solving uh, Laplace's equation for what you'd done when you were uh, injecting a, uh, a current through a point contact, the only way that the currents can flow would be to fan out like so. However, the neat argument is if you're in a hydrodynamic fluid, the viscosity will allow some kind of backflow and certainly allows a non-local relationship between current and voltage. And the prediction of theory is that as you then go away from uh, this point and you study the voltage as a function of distance, you should get a point where you get a negative voltage here, essentially because of that backflow. And the argument they make is that you can never get that negative voltage in an ohmic situation, and therefore that this negative resistance measurement is an absolutely killer, uh, couldn't be wrong identification of electron hydrodynamics. So they do extremely nice experiments this is one of those experiments where any of the old hand guys like Molenkamp who've worked on ballistics, they know fine that there are ballistic effects that can also give you negative resistances. So this paper is in you know, exactly that thing of ignoring the third regime. And uh, it's not totally clear, and I'll have a couple of things to say about that. There would be some checks that maybe one would like to see done there, but it's an extremely interesting experiment. Okay, so my voice uh, is beginning to die. We're just before 10 to 5. Why don't we come back at 5 past 5? And anybody who wants to ask me questions can do so in the meantime.
Okay. I guess we better get moving again. So we've reached this point, and up to this point, this is graphene, but doped to be a semi-metal, so what you're looking at is not, it's deliberately tuned away from attempts to reach the charge neutrality point. As I was advertising, here's an experiment where what they tried to do was to get exactly to the charge neutrality point and then cool the system down. And what they see here is, uh, I hope some of you remember, there's a relationship in a Fermi liquid called the Wiedemann-Franz law, and that relates the electrical conductivity to the thermal conductivity. It turns out, and this is beyond what I'm going to talk about today, that one of the predictions of hydrodynamic transport is that the Wiedemann-Franz law is, is expected to be violated because charge and heat are transported differently in a, in a system conforming to the hydrodynamic paradigms. So what they did, uh, a very clever experiment in Philip Kim's group at Harvard, and they uh, found a very clever piece of graphics which always helps you sell your results, where they show that blue here is the Wiedemann-Franz law being obeyed, and red is, and yellow and light blue are violations with this nice deep red being the biggest violation. So they're seeing about a factor of 20 violation of the Wiedemann-Franz law in this region of their phase diagram. Very near the charge, round, clustered around the charge neutrality point and at about 60 Kelvin. And this then helps to illustrate some of the more general problems with the experimental field. If they go down to lower temperatures, Impurity scattering, well, when I say impurity, it's this charged puddle scattering that they get. They get static disorder, which kicks in and, is, uh, and kills their observability of the, of the uh, Wiedemann-Franz law violation. They go to higher temperatures, electron-phonon scattering comes in and uh, dominates the momentum, and that momentum relaxing electron-phonon scattering dominates the uh, momentum conserving scattering. So they actually have this hot spot for the observation of what they attribute to a, a hydrodynamic violation of standard transport. And this is again general to hydrodynamic experiments. It can be that you need to find just the right temperature and density window to see the effects that you're looking for. So now though, I'd like to talk more for a while about our work. And I'd like to tell you why it was kind of insane to think about trying an experiment here and then tell you about the get at the, the uh, loophole that we were trying to exploit. So it's insane to try it on a full metal because the Fermi temperature will be very high, and that means that at your experimental temperatures, the electron-electron mean free path will be extremely long. Say at copper at 10 Kelvin, the electron-electron mean free path is centimeters. So, you know, whereas what you're always wanting is a mean free path of hundreds of nanometers. Even if you could somehow find a way of getting that electron, electron mean free path to be shorter by cranking up the electron electron scattering, if your Fermi surface is big, then the umclap processes for electro electron that I told you about will come in and spoil that as well. So there's lots of reasons to not want to trust electron electron scattering to do what you want here. And the expectation in a standard metal is that you'll always be stuck with the momentum conserving mean free path being much longer than the momentum relaxing one. In other words, standard metals you would think would always be stuck in the ohmic regime. However, we decided to try some experiments because we've been working in our group for a number of years now on a really surprising set of metals called the Della Fossites. That name is because there was a French crystallographer called De La Fosse, and uh, the series was named after him, but nobody can say it. That's, uh, you can tell whether you've entered this field or not, whether you can say the name of the materials. So the way the materials are is that they're very simple. They have triangular lattice uh, layers, either in the metallic ones of palladium or platinum, and in the simplest ones of all, you have cobalt oxide octahedra, which are completely non-magnetic, just acting as separators to make the, the metallic layers sit a long way apart and give you a two-dimensional material. Because they're two-dimensional and very pure, they give fantastic photo emission, 
uh, and we've been able to uh, categorize the Fermi surfaces really in a lot of detail with photo emission experiments. They're always hexagonal cylinders, very two-dimensional materials, uh, and the degree of faceting of the cylinders changes slightly from material to material. But the, when, whenever I'm looking for materials to work on in our research group, the two criteria is whatever physics we're trying to study, we want them to be very pure, or we want them to be very simple. I'm going to show you how pure these are in a moment, but this single hexagonal Fermi surface is, is more or less as simple as you can get in anything non-trivial. So the reason we became interested in them comes from just looking at a chart of the room temperature resistivities of metals. So here we have, back to your textbook days, the alkali series of metals with their nearly spherical Fermi surfaces. These are all their resistivities. Turns out that the resistivity at room temperature of elemental platinum and elemental palladium are rather similar. There are a couple of the most famous highly conducting oxides put in here. But down at the bottom of the curve of the chart, there are all the world's highest conducting metals at room temperature. So they, you know, at the moment, they include copper and silver. Copper's a bit cheaper. One of the reasons we use copper in all our wires is that fantastic conductivity. What's extremely surprising then, and particularly to anybody who you know, had a long history of working on oxides like me, is to see two oxides in this cluster of extremely conducting metals. What's even more surprising is that the way you relate resistivity to the microscopic mean free path always depends on the carrier density. The carrier density is much lower per volume in these materials because they're layered. So actually the carry volume carrier density is about a third lower than it is in copper or silver. So in fact, the proper metals, you know, one electron per, con one conduction electron per atom, the proper metals that we know of everything the delphosites are the highest conductivity at room temperature uh, per, per carrier, which is not fully understood. We're working on it, but uh, it's just straight away, it was, to me, it was a remarkable fact. And I was aware that other people were work, uh, working on these materials, only a few, and I thought, okay, we should be interested in these. The next good point is that, so the room temperature resistivity is extremely low because the conductivity is extremely high. But as you go further down in temperature, the, room, the resistivity falls even further, such that you can do a low temperature resistivity measurement and you end up deducing that the mean free path for motion in the planes is about 20 to 50 microns. It's absolutely huge. And in the semiconductor business, it took 30 years of refinement and special uh, growth techniques to get to mean free paths that long. In these materials, they're jumping out at you when you do a very simple crystal growth, uh, sometimes using a vapor, sometimes using a liquid. And we, you know, we, Xing, Xing Hun Kim in our group grows these things nowadays almost on a daily basis because we're, we're using a lot of them because we're doing many experiments on them. So they're very two dimensional. Now, there is some evidence, which I'll discuss later in more depth, for a, a phenomenon called phonon drag. And phonon drag is the one exception that I was telling you to phonons being bad for hydrodynamics. Turns out that if you're dragging your phonons, they can become good for hydrodynamics, and that is what we were wondering about here. The other thing, experimental development, to tell you about, which is relatively recent, is that the other thing you need to, to do hydrodynamic or, or ballistic experiments is the ability to make mesoscopic devices from the materials of interest. For a long time, you could only do that uh, reliably with semiconductor 2 decks. Then graphene came along, and great techniques were developed for doing that. Now people are being able to show that focused ion beam sculpting uh, is a way of taking as grown single crystals of almost anything and making exactly the device geometry that you want from them. So there's an as grown crystal of palladium cobaltate. It's hexagonal, it's a, it's a triangular lattice, so it has these hexagonal type facets. There's another one, you can see the outline of it. But everything else here, what's in dark is the crystal after you've cut away the crystal. What's in light, sorry, is the crystal after you've cut away the crystal to give you all these almost black trenches. <laughs> 
So what, you, what we've created there, or what Nabanil and Nandi created, is current injection through a special meander, which is for technical reasons, into a bar, a channel of a defined width. We have eight voltage contacts on that channel, so we can do multi-contact measurement, both of the magneto resistance if we apply a field and of the Hall effect. But you know, the, the point's a general one. It's really now technically becoming feasible to do experiments um, on interesting materials in ways that were impossible even 10 years ago, and that's a great development. So if you measure, if you look very carefully at the resistivity of palladium cobaltate at low temperatures, this is what you see. Now, so you see that the resistivity, if anything, it may even drift up a little bit at low temperatures, which isn't implausible in a hydrodynamic situation. But by and large, what you would say is it's more or less completely temperature independent below 10 Kelvin. And then it turns on. And although the difference is small, if you're doing a, a low noise measurement, you can very clearly distinguish what the resistivity is really doing there from the red dotted line. The red dotted line is the T to the fifth that you would have in what's called the bloch grunison law that many of you will have come across as undergraduates. Actually, the function that you're able to fit through the resistivity is exponential. And if you just do that blindly, you fit out a characteristic temperature for your exponential, meaning that you have some sort of uh, gapped process of scattering. You get out a temperature T naught, which would be about 165 Kelvin. And the, uh, the reason that this is happening is a very interesting one. It actually goes back to an argument that Piles had with Bloch in the 1930s. So Bloch and Grunizer, or Bloch postulated the standard laws for the electron phonon resistivity of metals. And that's involving a really big assumption because it's saying that you have your electrons scattering from your phonons just in equilibrium, the material sitting there. Then you apply a voltage and you give the electron assembly some momentum. The assumption of the bloch grunison law is that the electrons are scattering off the phonons while this is happening, but without giving any of that net momentum to the phonon assembly. So the phonons are staying at zero net momentum, decoupled enough from the electrons that they can equilibrate, but coupled enough that they can scatter the electrons. And when Bloch wrote that down in the 30s, Pyle straight away said, that isn't what's going to happen. If the electrons are scattering strongly from the phonons, the phonons will themselves gather some momentum from the electrons. The electrons going out of equilibrium will drag the phonons with them. And that effect of phonon drag was looked, at, looked for in many compounds. It's been quite easy to see it in thermal transport, but it's been very difficult to see it in electrical transport, partly because the characteristic temperature uh, associated with the, the drag is much lower in most materials than it is here. But let me explain that for you a moment. So let's imagine that we are dragging our phonons perfectly so that all of the electron phonon scattering that's just normal electron phonon scattering around our Fermi surface just results in dragged phonons and no observable uh, contribution to bulk resistivity because the phonons just get the momentum of the electrons. Then the first electron phonon process that you're going to see will be an umclap one when the phonon has enough wave vector to scatter you across the zone uh, into the second zone to give you an umclap process. You can calculate the characteristic energy for that if you know the gap in k-space and you know the sound velocity, you can then calculate an umclap temperature. And when we did that and we compared it to our measured T naught, it came out numerically very similar. So that combined with the exponential onset makes us wonder whether we're dragging our phonons at the, um, the, with the normal electron phonon processes involve phonon drag. And that's important because those dragged phonons are suddenly the friends of hydrodynamics. Normally, phonons are just the enemy of hydrodynamics, but dragged ones are the friends of hydrodynamics because that coupled electron-phonon soup conserves its own internal momentum. And that's exactly what you want for, the, the, for getting a combined viscosity from that soup. Uh, that's also something that had been considered theoretically uh, in the 60s by Gurji. It's one of the regimes he wrote papers about. Of course, being honest, it's always the best thing. We were not looking for this. 
I had never heard of Piles' argument. I'd never thought about phonon drag in my life. We just made the empirical observation that we couldn't fit the traditional function through our data and we could fit a different one. And then we started thinking about it. Yes? Yes, okay, so you, yes, you can do it, or what you can do is you can check, rather than that sort of fit, you can always plot in log log to see whether what you've got is fundamentally a power law of any power or not, and that's essentially what you're asking. So even if we varied the power away from five and left that as a fitting parameter as well, we still can't fit the data properly with any power. Yeah. So with that in mind, that was why I thought, OK, we have a very strange material here. Electron hydrodynamics is looking interesting. At that point, there were no modern experiments. The graphene stuff hadn't been published. Thought, why don't we try an experiment? And the type of experiment that we were thinking of is motivated by the following. Here you have kinetic calculations giving you three different predictions. The color scheme is pretty horrible, but uh, just look at the lines. If you have LMC a thousand times LMR, then you're just then you're in the ballistic regime, right? Because for, for a given wire size. Uh, whereas if you have LMC five thousandths of LMR, you'll be in the hydrodynamic regime. And the difference comes that the hydrodynamic regime shows this curved onset and quite a low resistivity at low values of this ordinate, which uh, is a dimensionless one that I think I shouldn't spend ages explaining. Uh, and the ballistic one does two things. It's higher than the hydrodynamic prediction for relatively wide wires when W is quite small. And then it crosses to be lower than the hydrodynamic pre pre prediction at very uh, narrow wires. And before anybody asks that, that's because in a narrow wire, you will always have some electrons which are just going straight along the wire. And if they're going straight along with a very long mean free path, they short out the others. So we thought we'll try that type of experiment. The first thing we did was to take our crystals, this was about six years ago now, and Philip Marl sculpted them into meanders so that we could check whether we could see the Shubnikov to Haas effect in them. Shubnikov to Haas effect is extremely purity sensitive. The question there was could we do all this sculpting to those samples and leave them with a very long mean free path? We now have 10 or 15 different ways of saying that we can do that. So then we just set out to do the simplest possible experiment. We created a channel. We measured it, its flow resistance, in other words, its electrical resistance for a certain width. Then we halved it, measured it again, then we halved it, measured it again, etc. And the, exper the results that we came up with were the following. So the red line is the prediction of hydrodynamic theory, and the blue line is the prediction of ohmic and then ballistic theory. And the data clearly look to be agreeing better with the red line than the blue line. That in itself isn't so impressive, but it gets a little bit better when you consider the blow up, because the blow up predicts the hydrodynamic prediction, as I'd said before, is of some upward curvature at low widths, followed by the hydrodynamic prediction crossing the ballistic prediction at high, at, 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 for high width, sorry, and at very low width it crosses. We see all of that. We see the curvature, we see the crossing point around, around the expected result, and we see the, the uh, different values for the very uh, uh, low width wires. All of that together was, you know, whether people wish to believe that line of argument or not, that comparison between kinetic theory and experiment led us to say, we're seeing a signal here which can be better described by including a viscous term than not. And it's just what you were asking about earlier. Again, it's a, it's a relatively small extra effect which is being seen uh, that we believe there's a hydrodynamic explanation for. So we published as well. And, and actually the two graphene experiments and ours were all done totally independently. I don't think we knew about them when they were all published in the same issue. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, so the woods we did, we went 60, 30, 15, 8, 4, 2, 1, and then we actually had a, a point at 700 nanometers width as well. Yeah, this is only one of, this is the first cut. Then he kept on cutting, so by the end you had something where everything had been blasted away and you just had a very narrow wire left. For each data, the thing came out of the cryostat, went back into the focused iron beam instrument and got cut again, yeah. Same crystal, yeah. So that was our experiment, and if you notice in the analysis of it, one of the things is that the conductivity of our wire in the hydrodynamic regime is predicted, or the resistivity is predicted to be lower than the ballistic resistivity for a given width, uh, over some range of widths. So a really nice experiment done by Geim's group in the same spirit a couple of years later, was they said, okay, we won't go for a whole wire. What we're gonna do is we're going to, and this is back to one of the questions I was asked from somebody at the back earlier on, different geometries. They decided to just make constrictions and they made these constrictions of different widths and they studied at different temperatures. And the idea there is that the correlations in a hydrodynamic fluid can actually, in some circumstances, make that hydrodynamic fluid flow through that constriction more effectively than a ballistic one would. So the viscosity gives some channeling, is the idea. And what they published is a paper saying, and this was based on theory from Levitov, who tends to be right on these things, that you can uh, do a ballistic calculation, and you would think that a purely ballistic, super pure material with no viscous effects would be the most efficient way that you could get current to flow through those constrictions. But he pointed out that because of this viscous channeling, it isn't. The viscous fluid beats the ballistic limit. So you end up actually getting higher conduct conductance through those, those restrictions because of the hydrodynamic effects than you would have had in the best sample you could have thought of. And that potentially has technological ramifications as well as uh, pure physics ones. And so that was now... There's always assumption. Everybody's experiment is measuring a signal, analyzing it with a theory, and then you know, coming up with some claim. One of the really impressive things that they can do in Geim's experiments, though, is that because they're working at density levels where they think that electron-electron scattering is absolutely the dominant source of their hydrodynamic scattering, they can then back out the electron-electron scattering length from the analysis they do and plot it as a function of temperature. And they then did uh, not just a total Fermi liquid theory, they did a Fermi liquid theory with some corrections. And they claim, but anyway, even so, what they are seeing is that electron electron scattering length diverging not so far from 1 over t squared. And that is exactly the divergence that was seen in the viscosity of helium 3 right back at the beginning of the first part of the talk. So this is a very important self-consistency check. You're doing these comparisons with theory, but you then end up fitting out a parameter, and that parameter should self-consistently check whether the assumptions that you put into the theory look reasonable. And getting that T squared, I think, is a really important point. And you know, the specialists may want to quibble with some other parts of the analysis of this experiment, but I think that point alone tells you that this result must be correct. Now, we can't do that because we're saying that phonon drag is the source of our collisions. The, the phonon drag length is extremely difficult to calculate as a function of temperature because you're making a crossover from normal to uh, umclap uh, uh, events. You don't have a circular Fermi surface. So we can get something which looks temperature dependent, not so far off these kind of temperature dependencies, but we don't have an easy theory to compare it to. So the next, then, the next um, obvious line of investigation for experimentalists is to say, what happens when you turn on a magnetic field? That's because we all have magnetic fields in our labs. It's not anything, and because we can control them very uh, precisely. I wouldn't say it's anything more cerebral than that. Right? What you could say, though, is that in classical hydrodynamics, 
creating a hydrodynamic fluid that breaks time reversal symmetry is extremely difficult. Right? You have to work very hard to do that. All you have to do with an electron system is turn on a field, and then you're studying hydrodynamics in the presence of time reversal breaking. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, this is one of these great things where it's only visible on the screen. Good. So at the time that people were thinking about turning on fields, there were no calculations of what, you, what the predictions of a hydrodynamic either Navier-Stokes theory or kinetic theory were going to be. So those were done, first of all, by Alexeyev uh, in 2016. And then Thomas Scafidi, based on discussions but not much more with the rest of us, uh, did a very nice Navier-Stokes and kinetic solution of this problem. So he is the guy in the world to now go to for what the uh, hydrodynamic and ballistic predictions for an electron fluid are. So we then went away and did some experiments to test what, what he'd been uh, coming up with. And if we go, these are deliberately chosen to be quite high temperature experiments to try to get our supposed electron phonon length down nice and short. That means, though, that all the internal length scales are very small compared to the width of our devices. So it means that the experimental signal is small. But everything looked very exciting. This is what we got experimentally. And this is what he could do with you know, minimal parameter fudging in a Navier-Stokes type calculation. So qualitatively, the data and the theory looked to be in extremely good agreement. And we came within moments of sending a triumphant paper out about this about four months ago. He'd worked on the Hall effect, which is another thing. There's a viscous Hall effect, which is now well understood theoretically. Navanil and Andy, who did the magnetoresistance experiments, was also doing Hall effect ones. The signal to noise is poorer for various reasons there. But again, the modified Navier-Stokes approach, field modified Navier-Stokes approach, can get a pretty good agreement with the type of things you see. So we thought there's only one more thing to test. And this is, this is I think, really worth, if you're, if you're going to get into electron hydrodynamic calculations, you have to be very careful. If you use a Navier-Stokes-based approach, you can still put some momentum relaxing scattering in as a phenomenological parameter. So you're very well capable of studying the crossover from hydrodynamic to ohmic behavior. However, that whole framework is not capable of including this ballistic regime that I had to admit to when you asked me. And so what we thought was we really need to check whether is this, this is clearly a signal consistent with hydrodynamics, but is it a unique signature of hydrodynamics, or could it also be explained by other effects? To my knowledge, the only way you can do that is with kinetic calculations. They're very hard to do numerically in these geometries and in these range of parameters. Finally, Thomas got it going, and it had a very annoying result, because it showed that you can completely turn off the viscous effect You'll change the numbers a bit, but you don't change the fundamental shapes of either this or your predicted magnetoresistance. So that's actually quite depressing, because that says that you can do experiments that, if you want to be optimistic, might be hydrodynamics, these field experiments, but you can't say they definitely are. And that's, of course, what everybody would like to do. So we've actually not published any of this yet. We're just going to you know, I don't know, lick our wounds and then write a very honest paper trying to explain this point. So yeah, there's the conclusion of that side. Uh, we may be seeing a hydrodynamic signal, but we're not sure. It's very sad. Now, the graphene guys, Geim's energetic group, have been doing these kinds of things as well. And they've tried to measure the, uh, the viscous Hall effect in a slightly different geometry to the one we were using. They have not been subject to the same kind of uh, uh, navel-gazing cycle that we've been subjecting ourselves to. So they've gone to press saying, we've measured the viscous Hall effect. Uh, and again, what they do have is, this time, over a much narrower range of temperatures, they can fit out the green uh, points and they say, OK, over this narrow range of temperatures, they're going up. It's not so different from theory. Uh, you know, there's a self-consistency check being applied. But because the range of temperatures is much lower, 
I think the confidence that you can give that self-consistency check is a little bit lower. And here's what's come to concern us about these type of geometries that they're using. See, they're using these geometries and they're using analysis techniques which are only capable of looking at the hydrodynamic to, to ohmic crossover. We, for very naturally, once they'd published this beautiful negative resistance experiment, we wanted to check the negative resistance experiments on our samples, so this is palladium cobaltate, made to very similar overall shapes and dimensions to theirs. And we were delighted to see, we're doing some field experiments here, but the zero field result is what counts. At zero field, we are seeing negative resistance, and we're seeing the size of the negative resistance go down as we make the contact separation from the contact point bigger. And that's exactly what a viscous theory predicts. So again, we could easily have gone to press and say, OK, fantastic. Uh, we can confirm this result from graphene. However, what happened to us was that just accidentally, we started doing the same experiments on bigger samples or different samples, and we didn't always see the negative resistance. So we started wondering whether the negative resistance that we're seeing was due to details of the size of this block of sample. And we can do a very direct check of that. We could make a big sample, Maya Bachman did this, and then she made the same big sample small with the same contacts. And again, to our sadness, she's able to make the negative resistance seen at zero field go away. And the sign of that size change is all wrong. If you had seen the uh, negative resistance in the big sample and then seen it gone away in the small sample, you'd be inclined to say, oh, there's some ballistic effect in this small sample, which is destroying my lovely hydrodynamic signal. But when you see it this way around, I think you really have to worry. We certainly are worried. We don't really know why it's happening, but we think it might be a ballistic effect. And what we don't know, but it would be interesting to know, is how much sample size checking has gone on in the graphene work. Right? However, the graphene work does have these back calculations to the temperature-dependent mean free path, and they look quite convincing. So I don't want to be giving you the impression, actually, I don't think it, experimental groups in our field tend to criticize each other, right? And that's not always a good thing because we're all exploring something new. We're trying to advance stuff. I'm just trying to give a rational analysis of what could be wrong with our experiments and what could be worried about with other people's ones. It's not that I'm trying to say that the graphene guys aren't doing a really nice job. I think they are. And if I were a betting uh, man, I would say that the evidence for hydrodynamic flow of electrons is far higher in graphene than it is in our experiments. I, you know, some of our stuff might be due to other things. So where does this now, these were the details. Let's broaden out a little bit to the bigger picture again. This is one of these amazing things you can find on the internet now, right? You want to know about where do electrons sit in viscosity compared to other things? I even refereed a paper the other day with a graph similar to this. The x-axis here is chemical. It's a completely meaningless x-axis. My students won't even show this plot. They have replotted it into something they could defend, right? And I received a paper with an axis as meaningless on it. It's really terrible. So here are all these classical fluids. You will know that olive oil is more viscous than water. You've got a good feeling for that. You'll probably know if you did chemistry at school that ethyl ether is a lot less viscous, right? And now, if you're a cryogenic person, you'll know from looking at it that liquid nitrogen is extremely non-viscous, and it actually sits down here. Liquid helium, which you can't see even at 3 Kelvin, is, much, is about as viscous as water. If you go down to 2 millik, liquid helium, as I told you before, is like glycerol or motor oil. It's much more viscous. If you put the electron experiments on, the two graphene ones, I mean the flow experiments and the charge neutrality point experiments sit about there. Our, the two DAG stuff sits there, ours sits in the middle. They're extremely viscous. Their kinetic viscosities are like those of honey. Right? Now, there is an issue here, though, because engineers and people, and in our everyday life, we kind of go smoothly to and fro between sheer viscosity that includes mass density and kinetic viscosity that doesn't. In all of the fluids we're looking at, that doesn't really matter because the density of everything is order of magnitude the same, right? 
Of course, the density, the mass density of an electron fluid is 2,000 times smaller than that of a similar fluid of, of something else. So getting a feeling in your mind for what that statement that electrons are as viscous as honey really means is maybe you can't just use what you perceive with the fluid you see to scale yourself very well there, I think. But anyway, there's the numbers. Something that uh, I will uh, cut off in the bud before anybody asks me, could you have turbulent electrons? In principle, maybe you could, but our Reynolds numbers at the moment are extremely low. So the, the viscosities mean that it's going to be very different, difficult unless you can pass really a huge current density through something. You have a chance of doing that in graphene if you work hard at your cryostat. And I'm hearing stories that uh, pre-turbulent non-linearities non are being seen in graphene at very high currents. Certainly the kind of experiments that we're doing, there's no chance of doing it. As I mentioned, uh, there's work now going on in general on high frequency effects. I understand that the question I was being asked earlier was slightly different, but uh, Roderick, uh, one of your organizers, uh, has been working on these kind of things and has a paper just published this year about if you could image the high frequency AC conductivity as a function of position, uh, there would be things you could see. And other stuff in that paper too that he could tell you about. So then we, I started the motivation by saying we were uh, interested in seeing whether electrons could be starting to probe this proposed low viscosity bound. Are we doing that yet? And the answer is no. The, the, most, the least viscous electrons that we have are very near the charge neutrality point in graphene, and they are still about a factor of 100 when you take into account that 4 pi away from this bound. The other ones are more viscous still. So at the moment, and, and the trouble is, you can't really get into the charge neutrality point at low temperatures where you would like to do it uh, uh, because of this impurity stuff. So there's, you know, it may be possible to improve there. It may also be uh, possible to improve by going to other Dirac systems, but Dirac systems where the fundamental bandwidth or the band gradient at the crossings is much smaller. Graphene is almost the free electron number, and that very high velocity is not good for you here in getting the Reynolds numbers to where you want. So it, it might be that you can, uh, not the Reynolds numbers, sorry, the viscosity low. So it could be that that's going to be accessible in future. Who knows? And then I'll just leave you with this final point. When I talk to you about resistivity of correlated or interesting materials saturating, giving you a time that saturated the bounded time, what you find is that whenever you have a T linear resistivity, which we're now able to produce in many unconventional superconductors and quantum critical systems, in many circumstances, very surprisingly, you can do an analysis, and in fact, we did that analysis first that showed that across a whole range of materials, the scattering rate associated with that T linear resistivity seems to be bounded. All right, so that means that you might have, in these type of materials, the fastest scattering going on that you could ever get with electrons. So the obvious thing to say is, let's go to those and see if that's associated with low viscosity hydrodynamics. Unfortunately, though, all of the internal length scales, the microscopic length scales, are extremely small there. And that means that you would have to go to fabrication of extremely small devices, which are smaller than the current uh, capability of experiment. So that may become possible in the future. I guess we have some ideas of how to do the experiments if we improve the technology. We'll need to see how long it takes. And maybe somebody will find some other smart way of using a different trick than just size restricted samples. The other route of growth is to maybe go in future into systems which have three-dimensional electronic structure instead of two-dimensional ones. Now, if you could do that and you could set up vorticity, as we know from water in a swimming pool, there's a tremendous extra richness, vortex loops and all of these structures of vorticity that exist in 3D that you can't get in 2D. So you wonder, could you set up uh, hydrodynamics in very pure metals with three-dimensional dispersions?
And the type of materials which are really being thought of for that are the so-called vile semi-metals. So these vile semi-metals, which are being studied a lot for other reasons at the moment, could also be excellent three-dimensional hydrodynamic candidates because they have three-dimensional electronic structure. So all of that is, again, well, it's not for, to all for the future. Uh, some of my colleagues are establishing that this phonon drag idea may well be occurring in, in vile semi-metals, so it could be possible to go to strongly dragging systems at very low temperatures and see hydrodynamic effects. And there are even some, some claims that that's been done already. So it's hard to judge how quickly you're going to speak. You probably won't hate me for finishing early. Uh, here are the conclusions of these two talks. Uh, I kind of get bored reading conclusions out. If the talk's been clear, you'll, you can read them yourselves and they'll be clear. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention at this late time and take any questions you have. <laughs>